Welcome to the conservative intellectual tradition in America. I'm Mallory Factor. I'm a professor here at the Citadel, and I will be your host through this journey of the conservative intellectual tradition in America. Our speaker today is going to be talking about the role of anti-communism within 20th century conservatism, its origins, and, its de and the development of neoconservatism. And he's going to contrast neoconservative thought with traditional conservatism and libertarian thought. Douglas J. Fife served as Under Secretary of Defense for Policy from July 2001 until August 2005. In that position, he helped devise the U.S. government strategy for the war on terror. And he contributed to the policy for Afghanistan and the, uh, for the Afghanistan and Iraq campaigns. Mr. Mr. Fife's duties included managing the Defense Department's international relations and representing the department in interagency policy making. War and decision inside the Pentagon at the dawn of the war on terrorism, his best-selling book about, the, about his work in the Pentagon and the war on terror uh, is an absolute must read for all of you. I strongly urge you to get a copy as soon as you can and to read through it. Also, if you do, but when you do buy the book, 100% of the royalties that he receives go to veterans. Mr. Feith helped develop the plan for worldwide changes in the U.S. defense posture. He developed new U.S. strategic partnerships with India and Pakistan. He promoted NATO enlargement, its reform, and crafted U.S. policy toward China. Mr. Feith advised President Bush on a range of national security issues, including the nuclear programs of North Korea and Iran, the counterinsurgency in Colombia, and the Palestinian-Israeli peace diplomacy. In the Reagan administration, Mr. Feith worked at the White House. Uh, he advised Ronald Reagan as a specialist in the Middle East, where he worked for the National Security Council, and then later as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Defense for Negotiations Policy. Mr. Feith received the Distinguished Public Service Medal twice that's the Defense Department's highest civilian award. Mr. Fife is director currently of the National Security, of National Security Strategies at the Hudson Institute. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce Douglas J. Fife. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm very grateful to the Citadel and to Professor Mallory Factor uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk with you. Some years ago, a, a candidate for mayor of New York City visited a, a senior citizen center in the Bronx and spoke about what he said was the issue, crime. He roused his audience by telling it, a judge I know was recently mugged, and do you know what he did? He called a press conference and said to the reporters, this mugging of me will in no way affect my decisions in matters of this kind. An elderly woman then stood up and with a heavy European accent shouted, then mug him again. Now, in a lecture on neoconservatism, which is going to be the focus of my talk, the story is apt because it brings to mind a famous quip by Irving Kristol in which he defined a neoconservative as a liberal who was mugged by reality. Let's start our examination of neoconservative thought by considering its origins. The two men commonly recognized as the, the godfathers of neoconservatism were Irving Kristol, who was the editor of the journal The Public Interest, and Norman Podhoretz, who edited Commentary Magazine for 35 years. 
Scholars have debated neoconservatism's date of birth. Some say it was in the 1930s when Crystal was a college student dabbling in left-wing ideology, but Crystal himself pegs 1965 as the start of the neoconservative current of thought, for that's when he founded his journal, The Public Interest. Who were the neoconservatives and what were their main ideas? They were men and women who had started their political lives left of center as liberals, or in the case of Crystal and some others, as Trotskyites. By the mid-1960s, however, they were questioning prevailing liberal thought, especially the premises of President Lyndon Johnson's great society programs for fighting poverty. They were skeptical about social engineering projects. They warned that the premises of such projects were often simplistic and overly optimistic, and the results were often unintended and negative. Though I intend to focus this lecture on neoconservative thinking in the national security field, the neoconservatives from the beginning devoted a great deal of attention to domestic policy issues. Crystal has written that neoconservatism, I'm quoting, describes the erosion of liberal faith among a relatively small but talented and articulate group of scholars and intellectuals, and the movement of this group, which gradually gained many new recruits, toward a more conservative point of view. Conservative, but different in certain important respects from the traditional conservative of the Republican Party. Crystal says, we were, most of us, from lower middle class or working class families, children of the Great Depression, veterans, literal or not, of World War II, who accepted the New Deal in principle and had little affection for the kind of isolationism that then permeated American conservatism. We regarded ourselves originally as dissident liberals. Dissident because we were skeptical of many of Lyndon Johnson's great society initiatives and increasingly disbelieving of the liberal metaphysics, the view of human nature and of social and economic realities on which those programs were based. Close quote. Now, if I had to capture the essence of neoconservatism in a sentence, it is skepticism about all isms. Neoconservatives are not a political party. They don't have, never have had, an agreed upon set of policy prescriptions for domestic or foreign affairs. What they have is a common frame of mind that they bring to the analysis of public policy. Crystal rejected the idea that neoconservatism is an ideology. He said it's a persuasion or a current of thought. The neoconservatives criticized ideological orthodoxies of the left and the right. They set themselves up as opponents of political ideologues of all stripes. Now, different people use the term ideologue differently. It usually has a negative connotation. When the term ideology is used negatively, it generally refers to a set of ideas that are premised on assumptions that people hold as a matter of faith, not reason. Though Dictionaries generally define ideologue neutrally as a, a person interested in ideas. It's clearly not a compliment to call someone an ideologue. And therefore, I define an ideologue as a person to whom the facts don't matter. In other words, when an ideologue has theories or preconceptions that are contradicted by facts, 
The ideologue does not modify his assumptions, rather he ignores or suppresses the facts. As the saying goes, you can't reason a man out of something he didn't reason himself into. Neoconservatism can be seen as the repudiation of such ideological thinking about public policy. The reason that Crystal and his fellow neoconservatives in the mid-1960s soured on great society political liberalism was not that they became indifferent to the poor or decided that the poor did not deserve help from the government. Rather, it was because they examined the actual effects of great society programs and concluded that many were doing more harm than good. The neoconservatives were more concerned with results than intentions which is another way of saying they were anti-ideological. But as I said, I want to focus not on domestic policy issues, but on national security issues, which is the area of my personal experience. Now, I've reviewed the syllabus that Professor Factor has given you and uh, looked over the assignments for today. Uh, which I assume you all have practically memorized. They are well selected, but they're challenging. And the discussions of philosophy are in places rather abstract. So unless you're from a, a clan of political philosophy professors, I can easily imagine that you're reading the material and wondering how many folks in the real world can make heads or tails of this stuff you may question whether the philosophy has much, if any, practical effect on ordinary people. So in the hope of making the subject a, a, a little less abstract, I'd like to talk about the neoconservative movement in the first person, from my own experience. My political evolution toward neoconservatism was similar to that of many others in my generation, so I, I offer it to you as uh, not just personal history, but kind of as a, a prototype. Now, let me share with you some of my family background. My father was a Jew born in Europe in 1914. The Nazis killed both of his parents, three of his sisters, and his three brothers. He came to the United States during World War II, and joined the US Merchant Marine. And in the course of the war, he survived the loss of three ships to enemy fire. My mother was born in the United States. My parents together created a rather typical Jewish suburban liberal home. The New York Times was delivered every day, and we read it and believed it. My mother thought that Alger Hiss was innocent, and the Rosenbergs probably were too. My parents voted for Adlai Stevenson, for John Kennedy, for Lyndon Johnson. I remember once sitting uh, on the edge of my father's bed with him, looking through papers in his night table, and he had cards showing that he was a member or contributor to the American Civil Liberties Union, the NAACP, and the Democratic Party. I grew up with liberal ideas on the major political issues of the day. At the same time, our home had important conservative features. My parents were patriotic. They gave their children religious instruction, a strong sense of family, a commitment to bourgeois principles of hard work and personal responsibility. We didn't think of them as bourgeois, but there were people who did. When I was a kid in the early 1960s, being a liberal meant supporting colorblind government, free speech, a strong American defense, and friendly relations with Israel. If one supports all of that nowadays, 
one is considered a conservative. When I was a kid, liberals like ourselves readily accepted the idea that America is an exceptional country in that it was founded with a mission not only to safeguard its own people's liberty but to demonstrate to the world the success of popular self-government. Liberals nowadays tend to ridicule or belittle the concept of American exceptionalism arguing that it's arrogant. I was in high school in the late 1960s and in college in the early 1970s. These years, of course, were dominated by the remarkably bitter controversy about the Vietnam War. Though America's involvement in the war was the work of Presidents Kennedy and Johnson, both of whom were liberal Democrats, liberals turned against the war and the anti-war movement became increasingly strident and radical. Anti-war demonstrations routinely featured speakers who denounced President Johnson as a, a war criminal, condemned America as an imperialist aggressor, and sympathized with America's communist enemies. As a high schooler, I was prepared to enter the army if drafted, but my views on the war were negative, generally in line with those of the liberal editorial page of the New York Times. I considered myself a Democrat, and in fact, I don't think I had a single friend who was a Republican. And I wasn't aware that any of my parents' friends were Republicans. But I found myself increasingly uneasy about what I was hearing from my fellow Democrats. The Democratic Party was assimilating the rhetoric and ideas of the anti-war movement, of the New Left, and of the 1960s counterculture. In 1968, support in the Democratic primaries for peace candidate Eugene McCarthy was sufficient to induce Lyndon Johnson to decide not even to try to win the Democratic nomination for president. And by 1972, the strength of the new left wing of the party was great enough to bring about the nomination of George McGovern to run against Richard Nixon. During college, in the innumerable discussions of Vietnam, much of the anti-war argumentation initially struck me as persuasive. I didn't see how that remote war could greatly affect us at home. The famous domino theory was so thoroughly ridiculed that I dismissed it. President Nixon himself was an unappealing character who lacked credibility even before the Watergate scandal broke. When I entered college, I knew very little history and had not thought deeply about foreign affairs. But like everyone else, I participated in endless discussions of the Vietnam War. Much of the anti-war argumentation still sounded persuasive to me. But two things in particular caused me to move away from the anti-war cause. First, I was repelled by the, the prevalence of extremist anti-American rhetoric. For example, the condemnation of US officials as fascists and the spelling of America with a K to make the whole country appear fascist. By the attacks on capitalism and the bourgeoisie and by the sympathy expressed toward the Soviet Union, which I knew to be an inhumane totalitarian state. Secondly, and of critical importance for me, I came to realize that pacifist, pacifist notions underlay much of the argumentation of the anti-war left. You remember the slogans nothing ever gets resolved by force. War is not the answer. Now, as limited as was my knowledge about history, I had a bedrock understanding, given my family history, 
that there were some forces for evil in the world that could not be contained, much less eliminated, through diplomacy and blandishments. The Nazi regime and the Soviet regime each had its own totalitarian revolutionary ideology and its record of murdering millions. I knew that diplomacy, though tried far beyond the point of reasonableness, couldn't solve the Hitler problem. I knew that the Nazi threat was in fact resolved by force. I knew that the Soviet Union was a serious enemy too, able and willing to use military power to spread its influence. And I knew, therefore, that whether war was the answer depended on what the question was. When someone asserted that war was never the answer, it registered with me as the proverbial 13th chime of a clock, which calls into question the integrity of all the previous chimes. All kinds of theories can be very seductive when one knows very few facts. An impressive teacher can easily make a complex theory sound compelling to a student who has no substantial knowledge in the field. I had started college as a physics major and was trained in the scientific method. I had assimilated the lesson that theories are simply hypotheses until they are rigorously tested against the facts. There were few major historical points I felt confident I knew to be facts, but the idea that Hitler had to be resisted with force was one of them. The pacifism that was an element of so much anti-war argumentation was the flaw that caused me to look with intense skepticism at all the key arguments of the anti-war movement. Those arguments began to unravel in my mind and I became open to rethink everything I thought I knew, everything I thought I knew about foreign policy and government. I expanded my reading beyond the New York Times and other liberal publications. Of greatest significance, I became a regular reader of Commentary magazine. Now, reading Commentary got me intellectually into neoconservative circles. And I'll tell you the story of how I entered physically, as it were, into those circles in Washington, D.C. The story begins in a situation uh, like the one we're currently in, a guest lecture at a college. In my senior year of college, uh, I, I was an undergraduate at Harvard. Uh, I heard from a friend that the diplomatic correspondent of the New York Times, a man named Leslie Gelb, was going to be giving a guest lecture at the great girls' school, Wellesley. One never passed up an opportunity to go to Wellesley. <laughs> and so I said I'd be happy to, to go there and, uh, and attend the, the lecture. And the lecture was on, I, I remember to this day, the title, Détente, Entente, and Irrelevant Diplomacy. And when it was over, uh, a number of us went out to a Chinese dinner with Mr. Gelb. And in the course of the dinner, I asked a number of skeptical questions about the, the uh, Ford administration's the detente policy, the policy toward the Soviet Union. And after a few minutes, Mr. Gelb said to me, you know, with with views like yours, you should be working for Senator Henry Jackson. And he said, I know Senator Jackson's national security staff guy, Richard Pearl. And he said, if you send me your resume, I'll send it to Pearl. Now, Senator Jackson was an impeccably credentialed liberal Democrat with a 
purity rating in like the 90% range from the very liberal Americans for Democratic Action. He was also a defense hawk and the Senate's leading voice of opposition to the Soviet Union. Senator Jackson was deeply skeptical of the Nixon-Kissinger detente policy. He brilliantly dissected the Nixon administration's arms control treaties with the Soviet Union and laid open their flaws. He publicized the Soviet regime's failures and brutalities, especially its mistreatment of pro-democracy dissidents and its refusal to allow oppressed Jews to emigrate from the Soviet Union to Israel. He successfully pushed for enactment of a law called the Jackson-Vanik Amendment, which made most favored nation trade status for the Soviet Union conditional on Moscow's granting emigration rights to Soviet Jews. Jackson showed how highlighting human rights can be used to galvanize popular American support for an assertive foreign policy and to undermine the standing of America's anti-democratic enemies. As the Vietnam War wound down and then ended in 1975 with the North Vietnamese conquest of South Vietnam, the main national security debates in the United States shifted their focus to policy toward the Soviet Union. The neoconservatives, having broken with the Democrats over their lurch leftward under the leadership of George McGovern and others, were by no means comfortable with the Republican administration's policy toward the Soviet Union. I hope you notice that I'm telling you over and over again how the neoconservatives actually positioned themselves or found themselves positioned between the leftists in the Democratic Party and the traditional conservatives in the Republican Party. And the neoconservatives were consistently in a, a kind of centrist position. This is obviously very important because the term neoconservative in recent years, and we'll get to this later, ha has suggested that, uh, that it represents you know, somehow a, a position on the fringe. But I, I want you to note this throughout. Now you'll recall that I mentioned Norman Podhoritz, the editor of Commentary Magazine, as one of the main figures in neoconservatism. I'd like to quote at some length Podhoritz's description of the Nixon-Kissinger policy of relaxation of tensions with the Soviet Union, a policy known as detente. In light of the strong popular opposition to the Vietnam War and the U.S. withdrawal from Vietnam, Podhoritz wrote, the United States, quote, had to find a way to restrain Soviet expansionism that did not depend entirely or even largely on the use or the threatened use of American military power. This new strategy, as Nixon and Kissinger conceived it, was composed of two tactical strands. The first and more important was to offer incentives, mainly consisting of economic benefits, for Soviet moderation and restraint, and to threaten penalties, mainly consisting of the withdrawal of those benefits, for aggressive or adventurous activity. This, in essence, was what detente meant. I'm continuing with the quote from Podhoritz. The second tactical strand of the new strategy for containing the Soviet Union, at a time of diminishing American power and will, was the so-called Nixon Doctrine. This entailed finding regional allies or surrogates who would assume the responsibility for deterring Soviet expansionist moves and if necessary resisting them by force. The United States would supply arms for this purpose but such regional surrogates as Iran under the Shah would do the rest. The opening to China, whatever else it may have been intended to accomplish, and there were undoubtedly many reasons for the move, has to be understood in the first instance as a product of the Nixon Doctrine. 
Close quote. Podhoretz was the key neoconservative intellectual critic of the Nixon administration's strategy toward the Soviet Union. One might say of this strategy, Podhoretz wrote, what Edmund Burke said of Lord North's treatment of the American colonies. This fine-spun scheme had the usual fate of all exquisite policy. Podhoretz continued, Brilliant though it was in achieving perfect internal coherence, it failed because it misjudged the nature of the Soviet threat on the one side and the nature of American public opinion on the other. Podhartz noted that neither Nixon nor Kissinger had any sympathy for the Soviets, nor did they ever doubt, and this is a, his quote, nor did they ever doubt that the Soviet Union had expansionist aims or that it was capable of great ruthlessness in the pursuit of those aims. While both men quote, always make their obeisances to the role of ideology in determining Soviet behavior on the international scene, for the most part, they saw the Soviet Union as a nation state like any other, motivated by the same range of interests that define and shape the foreign policies of all nation states. From this perspective, the perspective of realpolitik, Communist Russia was not all that different from Tsarist Russia. The facts of geography, history, and ancestral culture being far more decisive than the ideas of Marx and Lenin. Close quote. Here is the essence of the neoconservative critique of the Nixon-Kissinger foreign policy. The neoconservatives believed that the so-called realist realpolitik school of international relations which argued that nations act on the basis of objective material interests in promoting their military and economic power and their respective ideologies and forms of government have little to do in determining their actions was altogether inadequate to explain the behavior of ideological regimes like that of the Nazis or the Soviets Podhartz wrote that if the Soviet leaders behaved in accordance with realpolitik, not in accordance with communist ideology, then, quote, it would certainly be possible to make a deal of the kind contemplated by the policy of detente. If, in other words, Podhartz wrote, the aims of the Soviet Union were limited, they could be respected and even to a certain extent satisfied through negotiation and compromise with the resultant settlement policed by means other than and short of actual military force. But, Podhartz continued, what if the Soviet Union is not a normal nation state? What if, in this case, ideology overrides interest in the traditional sense? What if the Soviet aims are unlimited? In short, and to bring up the by now familiar contending comparisons, what if the Soviet Union bears a closer resemblance to the Germany of Hitler than to the Germany of Kaiser Wilhelm? Wilhelmine Germany was an expansionist power seeking a place in the imperial sun and nothing more than that. Hitler, by contrast, and again I'm, I'm quoting Podhartz at length here, Hitler, by contrast, was a revolutionary seeking to overturn the going international system and to replace it with a new order dominated by Germany, which also meant the political culture of Nazism. For tactical reasons and in order to mislead, Hitler sometimes pretended that all he wanted was the satisfaction of specific grievances. And those who were taken in by this pretense, not unreasonably thought they could do business with him. But there was no way of doing business that is, negotiating a peaceful settlement with Hitler. As a revolutionary with unlimited aims, he offered only two choices, resistance or submission. Close quote. Podhartz argued that the Soviet Union posed the same kind of threat to the West. Neoconservatives believed in the importance of ideas, 
not just military and economic interests in world affairs. One of their main contributions to national security thinking was to emphasize the role of ideology in national security affairs. This was important to understand the motivations of ideological regimes in the world and also to bring to the fore the moral dimension of national security policy for Americans and for citizens of other democratic countries. Whereas the so-called realists spoke of the Cold War as essentially a clash of great powers, the conservatives spoke of it, the neoconservatives spoke of it as a battle between liberal democracy and totalitarian communism. The realists often referred to the Soviet Union simply as Russia, as a way of de-emphasizing the ideological nature of the regime in Moscow. Podhoretz argued that that regime has committed itself by word and deed to the creation of a socialist world. He went on, quote, there is no reason to think it can be talked out of this commitment or even, as at bottom detente assumes, bribed out of it. It may well be, as we are often told, that the Soviet leaders no longer believe subjectively in communism. But whatever they say to themselves in the privacy of their own minds, they are, to borrow from their own vocabulary, objectively the prisoners of Marxian and Leninist doctrines. Without these doctrines, which mandate steady international advances in the cause of socialism, they have no way to legitimize their monopoly of power within the Soviet Union itself. Hence, even if they wanted to limit their aims and become a status quo power, they would be unable to do so without committing political suicide. What this means is that the conflict between the Soviet Union and the West is not subject to resolution by the traditional tools of diplomacy. Or to put it another way, given the nature of the Soviet threat, detente is not possible. Certain, arguments may be poss certain agreements may be possible from time to time, but they will invariably cover ground, cultural exchanges, arrangements for travel and communications and the like, that is peripheral or even trivial from the point of view of the central issue. Where really important ground is touched upon, the agreement will invariably result in a Soviet advantage, Podhoretz wrote. This is not because the Soviets are necessarily better at negotiating than we are, or because they will necessarily cheat. They may or may not be better, and they may or may not cheat. It is rather because in any negotiation between a party with limited aims and a party with unlimited aims, the party with limited aims is bound to lose in the very nature of things. Even a deal that on the surface promises mutual benefits will work out to the advantage of the side pursuing a strategy of victory over the side pursuing a strategy of accommodation and peace. Close quote. I argue that it is hard to overstate the importance of this neoconservative critique of the Nixon administration's strategy toward the Soviet Union. It brought together practical political leaders like Senator Jackson with intellectuals like Podhoretz, Professor Jean Kirkpatrick of Georgetown University and Professor Eugene V. Rostow of Yale Law School. The two main national security points made by the neoconservatives in the 1970s can be summarized in a few words. First, ideas have consequences. Ideas matter. This is to say that the so-called realist school is not realistic when it overemphasizes the importance of guns and money, as it were, and de-emphasizes the importance in world affairs of ideology, ignoring or downplaying America's practical as well as moral interest in supporting individual rights and democracy abroad. The second main neoconservative point is captured by the slogan, peace through strength. This is not only an answer to 
pacifists who deny the relationship between peace and military power, but also a skeptical observation about diplomacy. In stressing peace through strength, neoconservatives were not making an argument against diplomacy. And no sensible person is against diplomacy. But they were warning that diplomacy alone cannot be expected to produce or sustain peace if unsupported by military power. When Ronald Reagan challenged Gerald Ford for the Republican nomination for president in 1976, an unsuccessful challenge, he drew heavily on the critique of the detente policies of Nixon and Kissinger. After Nixon resigned in 1974, Kissinger remained as Secretary of State throughout Ford's presidency. Reagan often sounded both of the major neoconservative themes, ideas matter and peace through strength. During the years of the Jimmy Carter administration, neoconservatives criticized President Carter for failures relating to both of these themes. Carter did not appear to understand the Soviet Union and the ideological nature of the Cold War. President Carter warned against Americans' inordinate fear of communism, one of his most famous remarks. He famously kissed Leonid Brezhnev, literally, at one of their summit meetings. He admitted to being shocked by the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan on Christmas Day in 1979 and said something along the lines of he learned more about the Soviet Union in five minutes after the invasion than in his whole life previously. It was not confidence inspiring. <laughs> Carter also lacked appreciation of the concept of peace through strength. His diplomacy was naive, as was especially evident in his efforts to bring the Soviet Union into the Arab-Israeli peace talks. And even though Carter became famous for hosting the Israeli-Egyptian negotiations that produced the Camp David Accords and eventually the Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty, careful students of the subject remembered that Carter administration officials at first strongly opposed the peace initiative of Egyptian President Sadat on the grounds that a a separate bilateral peace would impede negotiation of a comprehensive Arab-Israeli peace. The crowning example of President Carter's weakness was in the Iran hostage crisis. After Iranian followers of the Ayatollah Khomeini broke into the US embassy in Tehran and held a large group of diplomats and embassy officers hostage for over 14 months. Neoconservatives were important voices of opposition to the national security policies of the Carter administration. Former military and civilian officials, many of whom served formally or informally as advisors to Democratic Senators Henry Jackson, Hubert Humphrey, and Daniel Patrick Moynihan, formed organizations in the Carter years, such as the Committee on the Present Danger and the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs that used neoconservative argumentation against what they saw as the naivete, weakness, and anti-Israel inclinations of the Carter administration. In the 1980 presidential election, because of the still unresolved Iranian hostage crisis, Foreign policy was a prominent element, and Ronald Reagan deployed against Jimmy Carter a critique that drew heavily on the themes that neoconservatives had developed to oppose the policies of Carter and Nixon. When Reagan was elected, he appointed many neoconservatives to positions in his administration. For example, Gene Kirkpatrick became U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, William Bennett became drug czar and then secretary of education 
Eugene Rostow became director of the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. Elliot Abrams and Paul Wolfowitz became assistant secretaries of state. Richard Pearl became an assistant secretary of defense. And I, still a very junior member of the neoconservative community, became a member of the National Security Council staff and, as you heard, eventually a deputy assistant secretary of defense. There were quite a few others as well. It was after Ronald Reagan became president that the term neocon became widely used. It was a useful term because it shed light on the sociology of the Reagan administration. Reagan's supporters and officials could be divided into neoconservatives, a fairly small group of intellectuals who, because of their writings, had disproportionate intellectual influence, and ordinary conservatives, who were sometimes laughingly called paleoconservatives. These groups had different backgrounds. Again, the neoconservatives were people who started their lives as liberals or far leftists. They were not the people who, as, young, as youngsters, belonged to the Young Americans for Freedom, a conservative organization. The neoconservatives were disproportionately, though by no means exclusively Jewish. They were people, by and large, who read and some wrote for Commentary Magazine, as opposed to the people who grew up reading William Buckley's National Review. So they were new or neo-conservatives, not lifelong conservatives. Now the neoconservatives had no connection with the conservative history of support for isolationism or opposition to civil rights. And the neoconservatives believed that this last point could help Reagan increase his support among other groups that had long been anti-Republican. So the term neoconservative, as I said, during the Reagan years was useful because of the, this, these different sociologies, as it were, of the, uh, of the different groups of important, influential Reagan supporters. Interestingly enough, the neocons neoconservatives and the lifelong Republicans, uh, lifelong conservatives, generally got along well in the Reagan administration. The strategy that President Reagan pursued against the Soviet Union was the neoconservative strategy proposed by people like Pod Haritz, Richard Pearl, Admiral Elmo Zumwalt, Senator Jackson, and others throughout the 1990s. The main point of the strategy was the repudiation of the Nixon administration goals of stabilizing U.S. relations with the Soviet Union and relaxing tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union. Reagan's goal was victory. He was once asked what his strategy is and he famously responded that it's simple. We win, they lose. Now this sounded flip but it was serious and it was based on the appreciation common to the neoconservatives and to Reagan that Soviet communism and the Marxist ideology on which it was based was rife with internal contradictions, to borrow a good Marxist phrase. Like the neoconservatives, Reagan believed that Marxism-Leninism was premised on misconceptions about the nature of human beings. It aimed to create the new Soviet man, an unnatural being who could be brought into being only through enormous efforts at coercion. Reagan believed that even through coercion, the communists would not succeed in changing the nature of the human being, who is a self-serving creature, even though capable of virtuous action. And Reagan further believed that the coercion was ultimately unsustainable 
And the natural desire of people to be free would defeat the communist efforts to turn all of society into a press that could squeeze the public into a new human mold. That's why he made his famous comment that communism would wind up on the ash heap of history. Borrowing another good communist phrase. Note that this weaving together of philosophical and practical strategic thoughts is the hallmark of neoconservatism and distinguished the neoconservatives from the traditional conservatives of the realpolitik school. Let's reflect for a moment on the magnitude of the accomplishment Reagan achieved with his Soviet strategy. He helped destroy the Soviet Union utterly. He ended the nuclear balance of terror. He achieved what I think we could say was the greatest strategic victory in the history of the world. For he not only defeated his enemy, but destroyed the Soviet Union as a state, and he did so without war. The way he implemented this strategy was through multiple means. Trade restrictions, for example, uh, including uh, economic measures like opposing the building of the Soviet gas pipeline to Western Europe, uh, putting export controls on high technology, arming the anti-Soviet forces in Afghanistan, getting NATO to support deployment of intermediate range nuclear missiles in Europe, the building of missile defense, which was at the time known, as, known by critics of the, of the Reagan administration as Star Wars, exposing Soviet human rights violations, embarrassing the Soviets politically before the world when they did things like shoot down the civilian uh, Korean airliner, and encouraging the dissidents who were demanding democracy and respect for individual liberties. Now these last two points in particular regarding human rights and democracy promotion were crucial to moving Gorbachev to launch the experiments in glasnost, openness, and perestroika, reconstruction that led to the crumbling of the authority of the Soviet leadership and the disintegration of the Soviet Union. These last two points were quintessential neoconservatism in action. In the Reagan years, the thinking of neoconservatives and other conservatives generally melded to the point that neoconservatism could reasonably be called simply Reaganite thinking. By the mid-1990s, Crystal could write, it's clear that what can fairly be described as the neoconservative impulse, or at most the neoconservative persuasion, was a generational phenomenon and has now been pretty much absorbed into a larger, more comprehensive conservatism. But the term neocon came back into widespread use after George W. Bush's election. It became a, uh, a useful handle for journalists and others because they wanted, at first, to understand what was going to be the philosophical makeup of the new George W. Bush administration. They were wondering whether the Reaganites would predominate or whether it would be the traditional conservatives of the realist school, people aligned with George H.W. Bush, James Baker, Brent Scowcroft. It turns out that George W. Bush was in many ways a Reaganite. Especially after 9-11, he believed in a highly active U.S. national security policy. He believed in peace through strength. He saw military power as inherently necessary and as a crucial component of effective diplomacy with hostile powers. In confronting America's enemies, he was willing to pursue victory and not just stability. But the term neocon quickly lost its integrity during the George W. Bush years. First of all, it began to acquire a bigoted connotation. 
because George W. Bush was strongly pro-Israel, and because the neoconservatives were, as I mentioned, disproportionately, though not exclusively, Jewish, critics of the president began to use neocon as a term of contempt to imply that the person in question was a Jew with loyalty to Israel rather than to the United States. Satirizing the bigots, the New York Times columnist David Brooks wrote an article early in the Bush years that defined neocon as follows. Con, Brooks wrote, is short for conservative, and neo is short for Jew. The term then became merely an epithet, a verbal piece of nastiness that could be used to smear officials whom the speaker thought were too hardline or too militaristic. I mean, it became as meaningful as fascist. I mean, when people in the 1960s were called fascist, nobody thought that that actually meant that they were, you know, members of the National Socialist Party. It's just, you know, it was a term of abuse. And likewise, the term neocon, without any reference to what it actually means or who the people were that were really neocons once, became used the way fascist was used. Now, idea, there were attributed to neocons and especially to the neocon officials in the George W. Bush administration, uh, ideas that we didn't hold and actions that we never took. The neocon officials have been falsely accused of having pushed for war without considering options short of war. Uh, it's widely but falsely believed that neocon officials advocated spreading democracy by the sword and that we favored war against Saddam in order to democratize the Arab world. That the emphasis, in other words, was not on protecting the United States from threats, but doing a political experiment in the Middle East. It's also widely but falsely reported that the neocons in the Bush administration argued that war in Iraq would be easy and that there was no need to plan for the post-Saddam period. All of these notions are false and if one wants to read the documents that demonstrate their inaccuracy, I, I suggest you review my book. I mean, it's, it's laid out uh, in detail, quoting from the original documents. And you can see the actual argumentation that we used and how in many cases we explicitly repudiated these ideas that, were, that are now commonly attributed to us. One of the, the many books that paint an inaccurate picture on this subject uh, and one that's, uh, one that's especially noteworthy is a, a book called America at the Crossroads by Francis Fukuyama. Fukuyama is a, a, a prominent scholar, a, a truly brilliant scholar, and he was a neocon in an earlier stage of his career uh, before he recanted. And uh, in his book, he makes the inaccurate attributions that I just mentioned. Now, what is remarkable, and this I want to emphasize to you because it's not only relevant to this subject, but it's, it's an object lesson. What's interesting is he attributes these ideas to the neocon officials in the Bush administration. And I was interested in that because to tell you, the, you know, if you think about it, there's really, there were really only a handful of people. I mean, literally, you know, four or five or so who were neocons at a fairly high level in the uh, George W. Bush administration. And by the way, many of them reject the term. And so, I mean, it's kind of a question of as to who qualifies. I'm one of the few people who will tell you, yes, I was in fact a, a neoconservative. Uh, and I guess I remain one, but I don't, I mean, the, the term is, for all practical purposes, I think, kaput. But the, um, what's interesting is there, as, as I said, there's a very small uh, group 
there, there were actually neocons in the high, higher levels of the Bush administration. And when I looked at Fukuyama's book, I noticed that there is not a single sentence, not a word quoted from any of us. And yet he attributes all these thoughts to us, that we thought Iraq was going to be easy, that we didn't think planning for post-Saddam Iraq was necessary. When in fact, we said the opposite, we wrote voluminously to the contrary in memos. And it's a lesson because it should be a lesson for all of you in critical reading. If you want to take subjects seriously and read books and, and credit them, ask yourself, what, is, what are the sources? What's the quality of the sources? One thing that's particularly interesting is what is done in this book is there are extensive quotations. The, the main theme of the book is that the neoconservatives developed a set of brilliant ideas, and he does a very good job of explaining the, the uh, development of neoconservative thought. And then he says these brilliant ideas were taken off the tracks by neoconservative officials in the Bush administration. That's his thesis. But he doesn't quote, as I said, a word from any of the neoconservative officials. What he quotes are neoconservative journalists. And I assume I don't have to drive home to you how unfair <laughs> it is to have attributed to one quotes that came from somebody else. And you know, one is not, as an official, responsible for what journalists are saying. And so it's, it's anyway, it's just, as I said, I think it's an important, it's an important point because it said, uh, I, I want to make the point to correct the record and I want to emphasize to you the importance of checking people's sources, finding out the quality of their footnotes, uh, if you're really going to be taking seriously anything that you read in the newspaper or in books. And, and I will end by simply saying that this whole talk should serve for you as a warning about political labels. Because, as I said, I think that the term neoconservative now is essentially meaningless because of the way it was used, abused, misapplied uh, by uh, innumerable people who uh, used it as a term of opprobrium, as, as, a, as an insult during the uh, George W. Bush administration. And, uh, and so it's an interesting point about political labels. And one should be careful about that. And on that note, I'll just remind you of a story that Abraham Lincoln used to tell where he said, if you call a dog's tail a leg, how many legs does a dog have? And the answer is four, because calling a dog's tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. Thank you.